Now what I'm going to talk to you about is generally about chemical communication in biology and I think my talk is at a level that uh, almost anybody should be able to understand it and at the same time I would like to introduce you to some new fields of research which are currently gaining popularity. I'm going to begin with a slide which emphasizes the importance of chemistry in biology. Now I was trained as a chemist and uh, throughout my professional career I worked in biology departments and I worked on biological problems. Now I know that most people in biology departments or in physics departments I do not like chemistry and uh, much of my talk is really going to emphasize the importance of understanding uh, biological processes uh, in chemical terms. I'll begin with Arthur Kornberg, the uh, man who discovered DNA polymerase and really started off the revolution in molecular biology. This was probably the first shot in what one might call the biotechnology revolution of the 20th century. And Arthur Kornberg, many years ago, in an article called Chemistry, the Lingua Franca of the Medical and Biological Sciences. So unless you really have a good feeling for chemistry, it is unlikely that deep biological understanding is actually going to come to you in any serious research problem. However, Kornberg also noticed, and this was in the United States, so it's uh, very much true uh, in India that chemistry and biology actually began to drift apart after the 1980s and this was largely because of the developments in what we today call molecular biology or what we call biotechnology. Biotechnology at least on the time scale of someone as, as, as old as I am is a relatively new subject. Now, physics and chemistry ha and classical biology have their origins stretching back into the 19th century. But biotechnology is about 30 to 40 years old. What Kornberg said was that the rift between chemistry and biology really comes because chemists and biologists appear to be using two different sides of the brain. Uh, he said the right brain dominated character of biologists. This means that biologists work more by intuition, more qualitatively, and use the part of the brain which is often used by artists and poets. On the other hand, the chemists appear to use the other half of the brain, which is used more by mathematicians and physicists. But chemists who work in the area of biochemistry write down the divide between biology and chemistry lie right in between. They must be schizophrenic, sometimes using one side of the brain, sometimes using the other side of the brain as they analyze research problems. And I'm going to show you today what, a real biologi what real biological problems are and how their solutions lie deeply rooted in chemistry. The topic of my address is really chemical communication in biology. But you might also call this chemical diversity in biology, chemical analysis in biology, or the study, if you were in a chemistry department, of natural products or molecules which are found in nature. But this is chemical communication. In your body, cells communicate with one another, and you know that the chemical effectors which allow cells in the body to communicate with cells in another part of the body is really mediated by hormones. You are what you are because of your hormones and uh, the communication between cells is very well understood and is the subject of endocrinology. Now you might ask how do organisms communicate with one another? Organisms also communicate with one another by means of chemicals. So for example, if a butterfly knows uh, which flower to go to, or if a bee knows which flower to go to, it is because you now have uh, chemicals which are put out by the flower, which now attract the insect. These are now volatile chemicals, which were originally in the literature called pheromones. The only thing that distinguished pheromones from the hormones was that the pheromones were volatile. The hormones were generally non-volatile molecules like steroids or proteins which were sort of floating around in your body. 
But there are diverse chemicals which are non-volatile with which microorganisms, for example, communicate with one another. The one thing that I want to emphasize in my talk is really the unity of biology. When you have a division of life sciences which is split into five or six different departments, what it means is that you now need to adopt a somewhat more federal structure. Uh, today, of course, the federal structure is something which is very popularly uh, talked about in India in terms of politics. But even in terms of biology, it is important to recognize the unity of biology and the need to integrate the different disciplines of biology. Now, I'll show you one example from real life. This, for example, on the campus of the Indian Institute of Science is uh, what you will see, termite mounds. That on the right side is the ever-present plastic bag which we are trying to get rid of. And you can ask the question, how are these termite mounds constructed? They are constructed by termites, but in addition, the termite needs a soil fungus with which it has to collaborate, and it's only the secretions of these two organisms together which allows the construction of this marvelous structure. Every one of you would have seen termite mounds and you would have seen those uh, openings in the termite mounds. How many of you have put your fingers into those openings? <laughs> Nobody. Why was that? What did you expect? Sort of jump out of the termite mound and get you. You expected a snake to get you. And this is what I was told when I was young. And I don't believe there are any snakes in those termite mounds at all. There are only termites and there are lots of microorganisms. And if you put your finger inside, you will find that it is distinctly cooler inside than it is outside. It is, in fact, a naturally air-conditioned structure, which is an example of green architecture, now a natural biological phenomenon. So these organisms have learned how to construct buildings and dwellings which are cooler inside than they are outside, and they're great energy savers. How do they do this? The soil is teeming with microorganisms, yet the termite recognizes one of them. How does it communicate? It's obviously not talking to it, and the only way it can communicate is by secreting a chemical. And it is chemical communication that then really mediates every single biological process. The one thing that I want to tell you is that those of you who don't like chemistry, and ask you another question, how many of you don't like chemistry? Put your hands up, boldly, wonderful. Many of you don't like chemistry. Now you can see there's no life without chemistry. You are chemical, there's nothing around you which is not chemical. And this is the first thing to recognize. The Royal Society of Chemistry actually has put a one million pound award to anybody who will bring them a substance which is non-chemical. Then it turns out that there is nothing in the world. And therefore you cannot avoid chemistry. You yourself are a product of chemistry and therefore better learn it. <laughs> now if you wanted to understand what these secretions are, then of course you could take a little bit of the secretion and put it onto modern mass spectrometers and get signals like the ones that I have shown on this slide. And therefore one might be able to analyze what these secretions are. But I won't tell you about that. I'll only tell you how I came to know this problem. I don't know anything about termite mounds. I'm not a microbiologist. But I got an email from a student in Coimbatore who wrote to me saying, can I come and work in your lab in the summer as an intern, and I have a project that I want to work on. And he wrote, and he had written this project. This was much better than any project that I've seen which has been written to a funding agency. So I was really surprised, and I told him, of course you can come to my lab, because I thought, here is a bright student, and he knows what he wants to do. I don't know what he wants to do. And uh, he came along, and then he taught me this problem. And then he said, he brought the problem, and then he said, how do we work on this? Eventually, I realized that I wasn't the right person to work on this problem, but my colleague, Professor René Borges, in the Center for Ecological Sciences, actually began then to work with him on this problem of how these termites uh, communicate with the fungus, with the soil fungus, and uh, the, that analysis has gone along quite a bit. But I've promised in my talk to talk about a field called chemical ecology, and I'm going to show you the first paper which I believe is the starting point of the discipline of chemical ecology, written by a man called Thomas Eisner, who's here on the list of authors. 
This is called biochemistry at 100 degrees centigrade. After all, we've all been taught that biochemistry is done at 37 degrees centigrade. When that is not possible, it's done at room temperature. On the other hand, here is biochemistry at 100 degrees centigrade. The Bombardier beetle, whom you see pictured here, is harassed by fire ants. And fire ants attack it. And when fire ants attack it, the Bombardier beetle would like to get rid of the fire ants. So what does it do? It simply throws out flame. It's a biological flamethrower. So long before armies invented flamethrowers, it turned out that the Bombardier beetle had invented how to throw flame. And the way it does this is that it actually produces hydrogen peroxide, decomposes it to hydrogen and oxygen, and then recombines the hydrogen and oxygen now in the process of combustion. So this is just the way, for example, the Indian Space Research Organization now decomposes peroxides in uh, pro propelling their rockets upwards with a burst of flame that you would have seen on TV. But there is that burst of flame coming out from a beetle. And uh, Eisner photographed this for the first time and tried to understand the phenomena. So it's a chemical process here. Those of you who know a little bit of chemistry will recognize that there's a hydroquinone, there's a quinone, so there is an oxidation reduction reaction. And then eventually what you want to do is you want to get oxygen, hydrogen, and combine them again uh, in a combustion process. I went to the literature then and found that there are many papers in engineering journals where people are trying to do biomimetic approaches uh, to solving problems, that is, engineering problems, asking the question, how did biology solve the problem, and can those kind of ideas be used in modern engineering? I found this very useful because for a long time, I was the director of the Indian Institute of Science. And the Indian Institute of Science is the only institution in India where we have exactly 50% of the faculty who are engineers and 50% of the faculty who are scientists. And so there's always this tension between engineers and scientists. And if you are leading this institution, it's best that you know something about engineering. So every time a professor of mechanical engineering or uh, would walk into my office, I would ask him, have you seen this paper or not? So he assumed that I knew a little bit about his subject and was then, of course, appropriately respectful. <laughs> After I retired, I needed something to do. And uh, the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore had started a program in chemical ecology. And having started a program in chemical ecology, they re realized the fact that they didn't have anybody to talk any chemistry to the students who come. And the first batch of students were recruited from the northeastern states of India. And uh, they said, look, they have to have a course, and why don't you teach for some time? So I said, all right, I have nothing to do. I will teach. And I began to study chemical ecology. Now, chemical ecology is a mixture of chemistry and ecology. So you can look at Wikipedia. A half of what is in Wikipedia is wrong, and the other half is right. And it is up to you to decide what is right or wrong. But the definition of chemistry seemed perfectly fine. But the definition of ecology, I was not very sure. But you could, in fact, test this out in the campus of the Indian Institute of Science. Because if you see one professor of ecology, you can ask him, does this definition sound OK? And if you see the next professor of ecology, you can again ask him. And if two of them agree, then you know they've, uh, this is right. Because usually professors will never agree on anything. And uh, I realized ecology is the scientific analysis and study of the interactions among organisms and their environment. Wonderful definition. How do they interact? How do they communicate? They must do this by means of chemicals. And therefore, it is a combination of field biology where you make observations and natural products chemistry where you analyze the molecules which are then involved. And nobody has said this better than Tom Eisner he passed away some time ago, but he said here that chemical ecology is the product of a partnership between biologists and natural products chemists, united by a shared vision and empowered by complementary skills. In any interdisciplinary research, it's important to have a vision. It's also important to be able to share complementary skills with your collaborators. In fact, collaboration today is the only way to go forward in biology. There is no other way to go forward, in fact, in science, 
but I think even more true in biology. And he said the vision stems from the realization that all organisms emit chemical signals and that all in their respective ways respond to the chemical emissions of others. But this is true. It, you can go back and ask the question, what is sensory perception and signal transduction in biology? And this picture which I've taken here is taken from a kindergarten book. And in kindergarten, you're shown this figure and you're taught, taught about the five senses. All of us know what the five senses are. We hear, we see, we taste, we touch and so forth. All the, these five senses, how are these senses mediated? When I smell something, I smell it because the molecules are being recognized by a receptor uh, in my nose. When I taste something, the molecules are being recognized by a receptor in my tongue. Even when I touch and pinch myself, that feeling is because there are mechanoreceptors. What are these receptors? These receptors are always proteins. And proteins, of course, are the molecules which I'm going to tell you are central to biochemistry, and some of you will be studying biochemistry. I wasn't very sure, but I heard the loudest cheer for food science and technology. <laughs> and uh, I assumed then that food science and technology was probably the subject which was most popular amongst the students. And, uh, Either that or the professors of food science and technology were the ones who were most popular. But food science and technology, biochemistry, physiology, nutrition, all of them are actually one and the same. Biochemistry has its historical roots in the study of physiology and nutrition. It is from nutrition that all the famous, uh, I think I would say the historically most important chapters of biochemistry the hunting down of the vitamins, for instance, was done. And now when you look at this, chemical or physical stimuli acting on a receptor molecule, which is invariably a protein, then result in a cascade of biochemical reactions in the cell. This is what is signal transduction, where a chemical or physical signal is eventually transduced. See, finally, your brain senses everything, and therefore, Chemical and electrical signals are really involved in this cascade. But if chemicals are to be recognized by other chemicals, proteins, then of course you have the problem of molecular recognition. And molecular recognition is embodied in the historical metaphor which Fisher introduced. He suggested that the recognition between molecules, very specific recognition, is like the recognition between locks and keys. So there are lots of locks in biochemistry, there are lots of keys in biochemistry, and often the task of the biochemist is to find the right keys to open and close the right locks. This is really receptor ligand interactions. Specificity of molecular recognition is central to biology. Whether you are studying immunology, whether you are studying endocrinology, whether you are studying neuroscience, everywhere it's the same thing. A protein molecule recognizing another molecule, a protein or small molecule with exquisite specificity. In the old days we used to think that plants for example secreted volatiles and the vapor pressure was high and the molecules went out into the atmosphere, they diffused and the insects now recognized this concentration gradient and came towards the plant or the flower. Today it turns out there are people who have now done research which suggests that sometimes plants actually pump these out. And they pump these out with protein molecules very similar to the kind of receptors that you have in your own cells, ABC transporters, which are there. This is now from the current literature. So there are newer and newer advances which one has to be aware of. But if you go back to sensory perception, Look at your eye. What can your eye sense? It senses a very narrow region of the visible spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is vast. Right there in the middle, you have a small region of the visible region. That's all it senses. Because in your eye, you have a pigment, retinal, bound to rhodopsin now, as a shift base, which has an absorption maximum of about 550 nanometers. So that's all you sense, and afterwards your entire visual process 
works with that sensor. But how do the other things sense? For example, your tongue senses this molecule when you have hot chilies. Uh, your nose senses this molecule when you sort of smell a red rose. And the ear, for instance, which responds to frequencies, responds to frequencies of a very narrow region. And there again, there are receptors in the ear which are able to sense uh, these mechanical impulses. But now, I know that in most audiences, you don't like chemistry. So the one way to keep you a sort of uh, angry at the speaker is to show you some structures. <laughs> and uh, I also show you where these molecules come from. Here, if you're a microbiologist, there's a plate, and you produce erythromycin. If you go to McDonald's and have this kind of thing, that's what you will be eating in plenty, cholesterol. Now, if you have this plant and extract from it, you get an alkaloid. Now, of course, these are all very complex structures. And then one can ask the question, how were all these complex structures actually made? Uh, who made them? Nature made them. How did nature make them? It used biochemistry to make them. Now, here are alkaloids. Here are all these plants. We grow all of them. Most of these molecules you should not have. A nicotine you shouldn't have. A cocaine you certainly shouldn't have. Morphine you shouldn't have. And caffeine also you probably should not have, but all of us have. Uh, now, these are alkaloids which are made by all these plants in large numbers. Did the plants make them for our pleasure? No, they didn't. They made them for their own purpose. And what was that purpose? That purpose was clearly an ecological purpose where if you produce bitter alkaloids, then of course herbivores won't come and uh, chew on the leaves. So there is a purpose. You can look, for example, at red chili here, turmeric here, and the principal molecules. Even if you don't like chemistry, one thing you should be able to do is to look at the molecule and just look at it like a painting and ask, do you recognize any similarities? And you will see the left-hand side of these molecules is very similar. And therefore, you could immediately guess that the receptors on which curcumin and uh, capsaicin are likely to act may belong to the same class of protein receptors. And they surely do, because there is a class of trip receptors which now recognize these vanilloid molecules. Chemistry throws up other problems. There is the problem of stereochemistry and chirality. These two structures look the same, but they're mirror images of one another. One of them is produced by coriander. The other is produced by lavender. They have entirely different uh, uh, properties. So that's just the background that you need in chemistry to tell you that chemistry is uh, complex and yet one must not ignore it altogether. We are revisiting the chemistry of natural products. These are produced by microorganisms, plants, animals. Microbiology, botany, zoology. And in fact, the one thing that has to be done is to actually get rid of all departments altogether and have all the students learn all the subjects. Because if you don't learn all the subjects, you aren't going to make much headway if you're going to go into research. There are two kinds of metabolites, primary metabolites and secondary metabolites. How many of you have heard about secondary metabolites? Wonderful. How many of you think that secondary is less important than primary. Now you didn't put up your hands, but by definition in English, secondary is much less important than primary. Huh? Why do we call them secondary metabolites? They have been relegated to the backwaters of biochemistry. But this is not true. I found this in the literature a long time ago, where there was a wonderful definition. It says, secondary metabolism represents the splendid idiosyncratic diversity of nature endowing different species with specific solutions to biological problems. So the chemistry has evolved in order for organisms to solve the problems that they confront in their environment. And that really is the study of ecology. Now you can ask, how many chemicals are there? And in fact, uh, even chemists don't like the number of chemicals that there are. There's an awful large number. So there's a lot of molecular diversity in chemistry. You can ask, what is the chemical diversity in biology? So on the next slide, 
I actually summarize the major questions that one might ask in chemical ecology. How many chemicals are produced in nature, which is chemical space? How many living organisms are there in nature? This is biological space. How many of you believe that we must protect our biodiversity? Fantastic. Usually when the majority puts up its hand, it means they don't know what they're talking about. Because <laughs> you don't know what your biodiversity is. You don't know what you're protecting. Uh, you must know what you're protecting. And uh, so we must know how many living organisms are there in nature. We must then ask how are these chemicals synthesized in nature? And why are these chemicals necessary for the organism? And last of all, how are the chemicals of one organism recognized by another organism? Now I'll show you some answers. Biological space. E.O. Wilson, the founding father of the field of sociobiology, in 1992 said 1.5 million. Some 10 years later, he said 10 million. So I'm still waiting for the next estimate, which might be uh, even more. Chemical space was about a million in 2007. It might be a few million now. Uh, people might have up the estimate. The real answer is we don't know, but it's of that order. Identifying biological roles for natural products when you search for activity is called bioprospecting. This is something that the Department of Biotechnology likes because, you know, prospecting means you're going to hit gold and uh, you hope that you will find uh, the next new antibiotic or the next new central nervous system agent by searching in nature. Identifying molecules responsible for mediating observed biological processes, phenomena, is chemical ecology. So they're really two sides of the same coin. But in estimating the number of molecules or the number of uh, species, uh, I don't know how to do this. And the best way to find an answer is always to ask someone else. So I asked a colleague of mine who's actually uh, a statistician, but who works in the Department of Ecological Sciences at the Institute. I asked him, uh, how do you do this? And he's not a man who answers any question. He sent me on the email a paper and said, you read this paper. And this is the paper that he sent me. He says, estimating the number of unseen species. How many words did Shakespeare know? So this attracted me because I didn't see the connection between species and uh, Shakespeare. But there is a way you do it. If you want to know how many words Shakespeare knew, you look through all of Shakespeare and find how many words he used once, how many words he used twice, how many words he used thrice, etc. How many, what were the total number of words he actually used? and then estimate the number of words he knew but did not use. And so they estimated he knew 35,000 words. You can ask yourself the question, how many words do you know? Uh, but look at this. If you read this, you know, you read something like uh, empirical Bayes model due to Fisher and non-parametric model, etc., etc., linear programming, you believe that you must take the authors at their word. And they are statisticians, they are mathematical statisticians, so presumably they know what to do. Similar methods, mathematical methods, are what are being used in ecology to estimate the kind of number of species that one might have in nature. And uh, I don't know how far this is right, but on the internet I found that there was a site at which people used this formula to find out how many words J.K. Rowling knew, how many words someone else knew. So I thought it was rather fun to uh, look at that. But having digressed, I'm going to come back now to my central problem of chemistry. And uh, look at capsaicin there. How does nature make capsaicin? It starts with this chemical, which you might recognize, which is the amino acid phenylalanine. And then it goes through all these steps. It starts with another amino acid, which is valine goes through all these steps. Now you can ask, what is the difference when biosynthesis is taught in an organic chemistry department and biosynthesis is taught in a biochemistry department? When it is taught in an organic chemistry department, these chemical structures are the only things which are emphasized. And when it is taught in a biochemistry department, only the enzymes which are written along these arrows are emphasized. So you will find phenylalanine, ammonia, lyase, etc., a whole lot of biochemistry 
protein enzymes are in fact emphasized. But what this tells you is there are many, many chemical steps in the synthesis of capsaicin, which is a secondary metabolite. But each step needs to be mediated by a protein catalyst. And therefore, it is energetically a very costly process. Because how are proteins made? Proteins are made, you need genes to make proteins. So you need all those genes to make all those proteins, and then those proteins will make the small molecule. So in many ways, biology and chemistry in nature are connected by two subjects which I think all of you will study. And if you ha are not going to study it, you must study it. That is genetics and evolution. Genetics and evolution are two subjects which I think even if you're not a scientist, you must know something about it. Genetics we all know, everybody knows. Because have you ever seen any newborn child which is displayed, all the visitors will immediately come look at it and say, looks like the mother or looks like the father. Actually, it will look like neither of them at that stage. <laughs> but nevertheless, this is said. Because instinctively, you know it must look like the mother or it must look like the father. So you know your genetics, you know your Mendelian genetics in one way, and therefore, you might just take it one step further. Evolution, of course, depends on selection and variation. And therefore, the only way biochemistry has evolved and organisms have evolved is by linking biology and chemistry together by means of genetics and evolution. Who have I pictured here? I have Mendel here, Darwin here. These are now the two pillars which have been of biology erected in the 19th century. There's been only one pillar, foundational pillar of biology erected in the 20th century. That is the idea of the chemistry of heredity. The chemistry of heredity is exclusively due to the double helical structure of Watson and Crick, but the double helical structure of Watson and Crick would not have been possible if Oswald Avery had not actually established that DNA was the genetic material. He established it as the pneumococcal transforming principle, but it's one of the great ironies of science that the Watson Crick paper does not carry a reference to the uh, uh, Oswald Avery paper. So if you have a substrate and if you have a product in that sequence of biochemical transformations, you need an enzyme. And if you need an enzyme, you need a gene. And therefore, for any multi-step biosynthetic pathway, you need unique genes, unique enzymes, encoded by separate genes. All these genes must now be gathered together in a modular cluster so the whole thing can be turned on at one time and the molecular secondary metabolite produced. This turning on all the genes together is something that will happen when there is an external stimulus. This is why today, even in microbiology, you can find new metabolites produced by bacteria if you challenge them with other bacteria on the same Petri plate. These are called cryptic metabolites, which are not expressed until they see something in the environment. So we have a great deal of genetic potential. Actually, we don't have. Uh, biological organisms have a great deal of genetic potential. Human beings over the course of evolution have lost most of their abilities. This is why today everybody is talking about microbiomes, because almost everything in your chemistry is really uh, produced by microbes which coexist with you. Francis Crick, if whatever I've told you so far, I told any of my biology colleagues and told them that chemistry is important and proteins are important, they will say no, uh, because uh, today uh, uh, genes are important. But you know, genes don't do anything except make proteins. In rare cases, uh, do they make uh, RNA or something else? And the person who recognized this, it's always better to quote the Pope if you want something to be uh, accepted uh, by the other people who follow the religion. So for molecular biologists, it's best to quote Francis Crick. And uh, he said the main function of proteins is to act as enzymes. And he said this in 1958. He said it is at first sight paradoxical that it is probably easier for an organism to produce a new protein than to produce a new small molecule. This is why secondary metabolites are much more difficult to make than primary metabolites. 
And uh, he says, there seems little point in genes doing anything else but protein synthesis. And this, of course, is one way to emphasize biochemistry as the study of proteins uh, rather than as the study of the nucleic acids. Arthur Kornberg actually said this very well in his autobiography. He said, in my theater, uh, the nucleic acids write the script, but the enzymes do the acting. And so if you extrapolate that, you can ask, if you see a movie, how often do you know who the script writer is? You only know the people who are actually acting in the movie. My plea today is for biochemistry. And uh, I thought I would show you this article written by a physical chemist turned molecular biologist, Sidney Brenner, who was one of the central figures of the molecular biology revolution of the 1960s. And uh, what Brenner said in the year 2000, the change of the millennium, he said, I once made the remark that two things disappeared in 1990. One was communism, the other was biochemistry, and that only one of these should be allowed to come back. This tells you about Brenner's ideological uh, proclivities, but uh, it turns out that biochemistry never really went away, and Brenner goes on to say, we do not have to resurrect biochemistry. It will flourish because it provides the only experimental basis for the causal understanding of biological mechanisms. So you need biochemistry all the while. And if you need biochemistry, you need biology. So just remember that secondary metabolites are important. They're sequential chemical transformations which require the intermediacy of genes and proteins, and organisms produce these when they are stimulated to produce them by some factor in the surrounding environment. The most famous example, which is also one starting point for the field of chemical ecology, in fact, for the first discovery of the pheromones, was the isolation of bombicol and its structure determination by Butanant. Butanant was the man who, who identified the structures of the human sex hormones and got the Nobel Prize for that. But in later life, he also discovered the pheromones. Now, he discovered that the female silk moth secretes a chemical which is recognized by the male silk moth, and only then the process of mating can happen. And this is very important to the silk industry, for example. So he went along to Japan and got the Japanese to correct for him a phenomenal number of uh, female silk moths from which he excites the glands which produce the pheromone and then tried to extract the chemical. His entire structure determination of uh, Bombicol is summarized in this one German page. And this one page of German, of course, you can put it into Google Translator today. The other day I saw that your Lieutenant Governor complained that she did not know uh, Tamil and uh, uh, she suggested that everybody else learn Hindi. She also suggested that maybe there will come a time when Google would have solved the problem of translation. I actually took this page and put it into Google Translator. And uh, then in trying to teach this paper, I put it into Google Translator, but then I don't, I've forgotten my German, but I know my chemistry. So I then pieced everything back together again and then put it back into chemical terms. And this is how Butanant determined the structure of this molecule. He got very little of this molecule from 500,000 glands. Phenomenal number. He got a very small amount, which he derivatized with a dye so that he could see it, and then put it on a column so that he could chromatograph it and follow the co color. And at the end of it, he then chemically degraded this with the most terrible reagents like potassium permanganate and uh, got the products like oxalic acid, butyric acid, and so on, and then pieced the structure together. These are heroic structure determinations which cannot be done today. But today, you have techniques to help you. And these are the techniques that you must learn if you are, in fact, going to get ahead in research. The founding father of chromatography, Mikhail Schwedt, said, that an essential condition for all fruitful research is to have at one's disposal a satisfactory technique. He went on to quote Descartes in the French, and what Descartes said was, all scientific progress is a progress in method. And this is something to remember. So chromatography came from Schwedt, 
has gone through Martin, Singe and so on and today you have very sophisticated chromatographic methods for separating proteins, nucleic acids, uh, metabolites, everything. The British theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson said that science is often driven by new technology rather than by new concepts. One of the dangers in biotechnology courses is sometimes you confuse technology for concepts. PCR is a technology. The basis of PCR is what is to be understood. So sequencing is a technology, but nobody knows the chemical basis for how Illumina sequences today work. And this is one of the problems, really, of teaching the life sciences. If you want to determine the three-dimensional structures of molecules, you use X-ray diffraction. Today, you will use cryo-electron microscopy in the vastly expanding field of structural biology. But where did this come from? It came from physics. Shortly after Ronchin's discovery of X-rays, the Braggs diffracted X-rays from sodium chloride. And from a crystal of sodium chloride, they determined uh, the structure of sodium chloride. They realized this X-rays could be diffracted from crystals because the interatomic spacings in crystals matched the wavelength of X-rays. But then you can see how quickly it moved through physics and chemistry to biological problems. The structures of proteins, the structures of penicillin and vitamin B12, very important secondary metabolites. Uh, well, now you have direct methods. Today, of course, Venki Ramakrishnan's determination of the ribosome, which contains a phenomenal number of atoms, is by this method. But today, cryo-electron microscopy is actually beginning to supplant uh, X-ray diffraction but uses pretty much the same kind of theory. NMR spectroscopy again began in physics. It began with Rabi's experiments on trying to determine the nuclear magnetic moment. Now, at that time when Rabi did his molecular beam experiments, nobody would have imagined that those ex determining the nuclear magnetic moment would have any use whatsoever. But from that came nuclear resonance by Bloch and Purcell, subsequently chemistry, biochemistry, and eventually medicine. So today, if you go for an MRI scan, what you're really doing is measuring the nuclear resonance of water, but you're measuring it in inhomogeneous fields and using it to image again. And these are all Nobel Prize winning discoveries, but what they tell you is that most of the techniques that drive biology forward today have their origins deeply rooted in physics, then tested in chemistry on simpler molecules, and eventually applied in biology to very much more complex systems like cells and organisms. The technique which I will briefly mention is mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry began with J.J. Thompson's work on the electron, went through Aston's work on the isotopes, which you use in biology, but Aston's the man who established all the isotopes in chemistry, went through physics again to develop new methods and back again to bio biochemistry. Mass spectrometry is a gas phase method for measuring the masses of molecules. And you cannot measure the masses of molecules unless you take them into the gas phase. But the question is, how will you take a protein molecule into the gas phase? How will you take the ribosome into the gas phase? They're not volatile. But those, that has been solved now with the methods of electrospray ionization. Therefore, molecules of any size, one million, two million, can go into the gas phase and you can measure their masses very precisely to one Dalton, sometimes even to a fraction of a Dalton. Just imagine, if I were able to measure your weights, very, your masses very accurately, I could ask Nandan Nilekani to put that as a biometric on your Aadhaar card. But why does it not work as a biometric for you? Because your mass and my mass keep changing with time. For the older people, it just keeps increasing. But uh, for the younger people, of course, who diet sometimes, it goes uh, up and down a little bit. So you can't use mass there. But imagine for a molecule. For a molecule, the mass remains the same unless you do some chemistry on it. And so if you do some chemistry, you change the mass. And therefore, mass spectrometry must then be the most important technique in chemical analysis, in biology, or in chemistry, because you can follow molecules. Today, if you did chemical analysis, this is what you would do with a mixture of substances. You will use all these sophisticated chromatographic and analysis methods in order to study them. But the activity-guided fractionation of natural extracts, the kind of thing which led to penicillin, for instance, 
is you take a crude extract and purify until you get a biologically active substance. You have a bioassay to follow the activity of the fractions that you're isolating. It's a very long and painful process. Martin, AJP Martin, the man who introduced us to thin layer chromatography and paper chromatography, uh, Martin in his Nobel lecture has a very interesting statement which I call Martin's principle. He says nothing is too difficult as long as someone else does it. So now for example if you are isolating a new molecule which is going to have magical properties, the professor will have the idea of doing the isolation but the job will have to be done by the student. So it turns out that as long as the students are doing all this chromatography and all the structural elucidations, uh, the professors can actually sit back. So there is a lot of work ahead of you if you want to find something dramatically new. I'll show you an experiment. Origins of Life experiment done by Stanley Miller in the 1950s at the University of Chicago. He filled a bulb with uh, a bunch of gases methane, ammonia, hydrogen. He also introduced steam by boiling water here and then he passed a spark discharge. Once he did this, he collected whatever gathered at the bottom and he got a brown black mess. And then he analyzed the brown black mess by what was available then which is paper chromatography and he found amino acids. So then he said this is how biochemistry began on primitive earth under reductive atmosphere, lightning and volcanoes and everything, and then uh, amino acids begin to form and you found the amino acids. This is called the origins of life experiment. The wonderful thing is in 1953, there were two famous papers which appeared. One was the Miller paper and the other was the Watson Crick paper. The New York Times featured the Miller paper and called it uh, the origins of life experiment. They did not feature the Watson Crick paper because nobody knew what the double helix was going to do immediately after the double helical structure came out. But the University of Chicago has preserved those flasks containing the brown mess. And someone's gone back, one of Miller's old students went back now in his old age to reanalyze the same thing with the new methods of electrospray ionization and mass spectrometry and found a whole lot of more amino acids which were present but which could not be identified at that time. If you take a meteorite for example and analyze it with mass spectrometry, each line here corresponds to a mass. You can actually find out if you measure masses very accurately, if you measure masses to the third decimal place, that is one thousandth of the mass of a hydrogen atom which is possible today, then you can find out how many distinct chemical formulae there are. There are about 15,000 chemical formulae in a sample of the Murchison meteorite which fell 40 years ago. Question which are, you can ask is, are these the result of terrestrial contamination or are they the result of extraterrestrial biology which uh, is an interesting question. But in conclusion I will show you why I have the interest to study this subject at my age and also to come and try to explain it to you. Some years ago, uh, Professor K.S. Krishnan, who is now unfortunately no longer with us, uh, walked into my room. He was my first graduate student, uh, but he was a little bit older than me at that time. And so the two of us actually worked together. I would consider him my mentor more than my student. The great advantage was when we began, I was ignorant, he was ignorant, and we taught one another. Um, he was a physicist turned to biology after doing an MSc in electronics and he needed a supervisor who did not ask him too many questions. And since I did not know any questions to ask him, he was my student. Now, long after he got his degree and on and was a professor of neurobiology at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, he walked into my room one day with a backpack and he appended the contents of the backpack on my desk and uh, said, uh, look at all these things, and there were all these shells. You know, the kind of shells that you will find off the beach here. He'd collected them off the southeastern coast. He'd collected them uh, near the Rameshwaram uh, area, uh, Chidambaram, that side, and uh, he had made friends with the fishermen. Every time the fishermen put their nets in, the shells would also come. They'd throw the shells back, he collected them, and then he came in. They smelt very bad, 
And I told him, no, 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 put it back inside, uh, don't want to. Well, what do you want me to do with it? He said, look, these snails produce toxins. And these toxins are what the snail uses to paralyze prey. And I've read in the literature that all these toxins are peptides, and you work on peptides, so why don't you study them? Uh, I asked him, what will you do? He said, I'll go back and collect some more shells. <laughs> and uh, so we began. And uh, this is the problem. The snail now can't move. And since it cannot move, it needs to paralyze prey in order to eat. And therefore, it shoots them full of paralytic toxins and immobilizes small fishes, worms, other mollusks, etc., and then engulfs them. It produces the venom in this duct, has this bulb to push it out, coats this harpoon-like structure, and throws this harpoon at the target. So the snail in this case is a predator, and the worms and other fishes are the prey. But sometimes, when the snail is attacked, it also does this to dissuade bigger predators from coming to the snail. Because although the snail has a very hard shell, sometimes the predator might get it before it has retreated back uh, into its shell. So there are both offensive venoms as well as defensive venoms. And these are a mixture of uh, molecules which Professor Oliveira has actually characterized at the University of Utah and given this term conotoxinomics. The suffix omics is very popular. And the one thing I would tell all the students here, don't believe in omics at all. Uh, all that omics means is there are lots of things. In fact, I would say student omics if because there are so many students. Yeah. What do you learn from? There are lots of students. So what this means is that there are lots of toxins, lots of peptides, lots of enzymes which are post-translationally modifying them and so on. So there's a lot of biochemistry there with lots of molecules. So you need now to separate all these molecules and sequence them. And that's what we've been actually doing over the years. But it turns out when you sequence them and you want to use the methods of mass spectrometry, Mass spectrometry is marvelous, very sensitive, and very high resolution. And since it's very high resolution and very sensitive, you would imagine it's easy to use. But since the mixtures are very complicated, you have thousands of molecules, and you will get thousands of mass spectra. And eventually, mass spectrometry is very straightforward. You take a molecule into the gas phase, and after you've taken it into the gas phase, break it. You've got some pieces. If you recognize those pieces, put those pieces back together, like doing a jigsaw puzzle. You will see this is no different from what Butanant did. Butanant broke his molecules with nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and potassium permanganate. Today, we will break the molecules in the gas phase with energy and uh, get pieces. So each piece will have a mass. And since amino acids have a given mass, I can now look at difference. So I can work out sequences. I need to know only addition and subtraction. I don't even need to know multiplication. So unlike magnetic resonance or crystallography, there is very little of theory that you need to know in order to interpret a mass spectrum. Elementary arithmetic would do. But today, of course, I find that students have the greatest difficulty in adding and subtracting. The local vegetable seller usually adds and subtracts very much faster uh, than uh, PhD students because they become addicted to uh, calculators. But I can now work on this because I can remember the masses of the 20 amino acids. And dipeptides, there are 20 to 2400. Uh, I can generate them. So I can work on them when I'm going in a car or when I'm sitting somewhere. I can do it at any time. I worked out the sequence. So it has aspartic acid, tryptophan, aspartic acid, tryptophan, etc. I thought it was interesting. But I can't work out the whole sequence. And I don't know whether it's going in this direction or I don't know whether it's going in that direction. Now, of course, molecular biology comes to my rescue with the new techniques of transcriptomics, or what is called next generation sequencing. It should no longer be called next generation sequencing because there will be another generation uh, after that. You isolate mRNA, uh, make complementary DNA, break this DNA into a million pieces, and then piece them back together to determine sequences. Sounds easy. I knew nothing about next generation sequencing. And uh, Professor Krishnan walked into my lab again some couple of years after we'd started all this and said, uh, we are going to do deep sequencing. I said, I don't know what is deep sequencing. He said, neither do I. He said, why do you want to do deep sequencing? He said, this way we will get sequences very much faster. 
and uh, you're taking too long to do them by mass spectrometry and you're not able to do many of them, so we need to do this. I asked him, who asked you to do this? He said, well, you see, uh, Vijay said that we should do this. As then Vijay, for those of you who don't know, is uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, who's currently the principal scientific advisor to the government of India, and at that time about to become the secretary of the Department of Biotechnology. So I asked him, who's going to give us the money? He said, Vijay will give us the money. I said, did you ask him? He said, no, I didn't ask him, but I'm sure he will. <laughs> so he went ahead and wrote this project for next generation sequencing and got some money. And after he got some money, we collected next. It's very easy to collect next generation sequencing data because in all these places you will collect data. You give them money, they'll give you data. But afterwards, you don't know what to do with the data. <laughs> and uh, this was the stage at which I began. And then, unfortunately, Krishnan one day suddenly uh, went away. And uh, then I began to learn next generation sequencing. And the only metaphor that I can have to explain it to students is like this. Imagine you have a manuscript in which all the pages are unnumbered. And they are given to you. And this happens to PhD supervisors sometimes. <laughs> and then you drop all of them on the floor and the fan is blowing. They're all over the floor. You're picking them, putting them back. You realize there are no page numbers. Now how do you put them back? You take one page, read the text. Then you read, pick the next page, find whether it goes above or below. It will be neither of them. You keep that aside and you do this. If you had a thousand pages, you'd go crazy. You'd never be able to do this because you're using context to do this. Now, what's the context that you can use with uh, 99 base pair or 100 base pair fragments? Only the Watson Crick base pairing context by which you can piece them together. Now, can you do this? No. And when you can't do this, the best is to leave it to computer scientists and mathematicians. And they will solve the problem, they will write a program, and afterwards you have assembly programs in the literature which you can then use. And then you can assemble uh, fragments, and then you can search for the pieces that you have found by mass spectrometry, identify the molecule, check now that it has exactly the mass that you measured experimentally. So here you have integrated now mass spectrometry and transcriptomics. The nice thing about this project for Professor Krishnan was that he collected a large number of shells. So the National Center for Biological Sciences has a museum of these shells, which are most wonderful. And we've collected genes, uh, uh, proteins, uh, toxins, and so on from this. Effectively, what we've done is, and it's kept us busy in post-retirement, we've done what Rutherford once said was called stamp collecting. You know, the physicist Rutherford very famously said, there are two kinds of science, physics and stamp collecting. And so what biologists very often do is stamp collecting. But you know, sometimes philately is a wonderful hobby, stamps look beautiful and uh, structures look beautiful. Sometimes they're useful. If, if I were given today the choice of learning a third language, I would learn either the language of chemistry or the la language of mathematics if I were going to go into science. Because these are the two languages which will be most useful depending on the subject that you're going to study. Sometimes when you get old, you wish you had learned something better when you were young because you would have uh, a good feeling for it. But now, why are there so many molecules? There are so many molecules because this is a classic problem of biology, the predator-prey problem. And in the predator prey problem, that the predator produces uh, paralyzing toxins. They act on receptors on the prey, but the prey doesn't want to be paralyzed. Therefore, slowly selection works to produce prey in which the receptor is now being changed. And therefore, these toxins don't work anymore. But the snail now doesn't want to die of starvation. So it will now change its toxin mixture. So evolution now gives you variation natural mutations, variation, and selection. So Darwinian selection working at the biochemical level is what works. So as receptors change, so do toxins. So we have this enormous chemical diversity in biology. But to explain this, there is a hypothesis which is called the Red Queen hypothesis. And I thought I should not, uh, I've shown you this slide, I shouldn't uh, go away from here without showing you this. I really like this when I read it. It's called the Red Queen Hypothesis by an ecologist, uh, Van Velen, who passed away some time ago. He looks every inch the way a scientist should look. Um, long hair and beard. Einstein's been the iconic image for scientists, largely because he never cut his hair. 
And uh, now you see, what he suggested was, he went to this book, Through the Looking Glass. How many of you have read Alice in Wonderland? How many of you have read Through the Looking Glass? Now every one of you should go and look at Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. They've been translated into more languages in the world than any other book. Uh, in fact, the place where it's multiple editions keep coming out is in Japan in Japanese. And you should look at it because there is science on every page practically. And sometimes these are the concepts, the fundamental concepts of the 19th century, which are in fact uh, coming out. In Through the Looking Glass, Alice actually in the looking glass world meets the Red Queen and they're on a big, in a big place where the, the space is divided into black and white squares, looks like a chessboard, and there are these chess pieces also, knights, rooks, queens, etc. And then Alice sees this and said, let's play the game. So the Red Queen catches her by a hand and they run around uh, the board. And after they've run around the board for some time, Alice, who is genuinely a scientist, a student, makes an observation. She says, look, we've been running for quite some time, but we seem to be staying in the same place. And uh, the Red Queen, who certainly like a professor, who now makes the interpretation, she then says, look here, that means in the looking glass world, you have to do all the running you can do to keep in the same place. This is something that you must remember. In fact, I think this is some, the Red Queen hypothesis is something that university administrators must remember because everybody wants to go up in the NIRF rankings and everybody wants to go up in the world rankings, but everybody is running at the same time. So if you don't run very fast, you must at least run as fast as the others to keep in the same place where you are. And this is what is going to happen. But in the context of the snail, what it means is that predator toxins and prey receptors evolve over time. The more they change, the more the interactions remain the same. How can the interactions remain the same when the molecules themselves are changing? Because you can now ask what is the fundamental basis of the interactions between molecules. And we, here we have to come back to the idea that the interactions between molecules is really the interactions between atoms. So you can change the positions of the atoms and get new molecules. But the fundamental interactions between the atoms will remain the same. And the fundamental interactions between atoms are governed by what I might call the immutable laws of physics and chemistry. All you have to do is to create new molecules by changing the positions of the atoms and this is happening in biology all the time. And that is why we have so many molecules. But the molecules that we isolate, for example, from the cone snail are also found in the butterfly by someone else. Now what is this connection between the butterfly and the snail? I do not know. But these are facts because sequences which we have determined have also appeared elsewhere. But finally, I should show you that the study of natural products can lead to very unexpected consequences. Here, for instance, is the famous work done by the Chinese under Yu Yu Tu at the time of the Cultural Revolution, where they isolated the anti-malarial artemisin. They screened plant extracts, thousands of them, on a brutal assay on malaria-infected mice. Can't do it now anymore. They found one extract which worked. And, but this worked irreproducibly. When they went back, and this is Yu Yu Tu's genius, she asked the question, why is this irreproducible? Your experiments will also be very many times irreproducible. But this is because something has changed. And it turns out that she, when she went back to the traditional Chinese literature, the leaf was, the material, the plant material was taken and mixed with water. Never did it say that the plant material should be mixed with hot water or boiled in water. And in cold water decoctions, the active principle was extracted. In hot water decoctions, the active principle is degraded. But if you go back and look at the structure years later, it's got a peroxide. And the peroxide is what I introduced you to with the Bombardier beetle. It will simply explode and combust, and uh, the molecule activity will be destroyed. 
The many molecules coming, for example, a molecule like this has been isolated from all organisms in the human nose. And uh, these are now natural common cells, which are now producing antibiotics, which sometimes may be useful for protection against uh, bacterial infections. You already have a natural defense being given by your own microbiome. So it is in microbiology that I believe that the most interesting chemistry of the future will emerge. Uh, the picture there in the corner I thought I should show you is Carl Weiss, and he is the man who actually introduced archaea into the biological literature and really introduced what you might today call the third branch of the tree of life. And when he passed away, I found on the internet a tribute to him where somebody had put this up and quoted Pliny the Elder, said nature is to be found in her entirety nowhere more than in her smallest creatures. All I would say is I would like to paraphrase this by saying chemistry is to be found in her entirety nowhere more than in microbiology and therefore there is a very good reason uh, for studying microbes. Thank you very much for inviting me and I hope that uh, all of you who are students here will have a wonderful time while you pursue your courses. Thank you very much.